Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we come to the third weekend of October, I think one issue uppermost in the minds of many of us is the Israeli-Gaza conflict that erupted on 7 October. For this weekend, I have prepared a message to explain to us the cause of the conflict so that we can pray more effectively about the thing. Many of us are eager to pray, but we don't have a complete picture of the conflict and what is Israel's role in God's master plan for the end of the world. Now I will lead us to say the opening prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus. He was with you in the beginning. You made all things through him. He is your word to us, for he gave us so many words about you so that we might know you. Lord, he came into the world, but so few received him, because most people prefer darkness rather than light. But Lord, we receive him, and you have given us the wonderful blessing of eternal life and the marvelous status as children of God. Lord, we praise you that Jesus, whom we worship, not only died but rose from the dead, showing that he is not just the Son of Man, but also the Son of God. He is the one who has reconciled us to you, making peace by his blood. Father, we praise you that we are your people, members of your household, and members of Christ. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
faithful and true, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, we give thanks. As morning dawns and evening fades, you On October 7, the world was shocked by the deadly attack of Israel by Hamas. Hamas is a military organization that operates out of Gaza. Gaza lies to the south of Israel. During the first 20 minutes, Hamas fired as many as 5,000 rockets into Israel. Israel's air defense was overwhelmed. Many missiles went through, hitting their targets. While Israel was busy engaging the missile attack, a few hundred Hamas fighters entered Israel to attack the villages near the Israeli Gaza border. As of now, it's known that more than 
1,400 Israelis have been killed and more than 3,400 injured. Israel didn't take things standing down. Israeli war plans have been bombing the Hamas hideouts in Gaza. When I prepare my message, about 2,800 Palestinians have been killed and about 9,900 others wounded. Now today, an additional 700 Palestinians got killed after a hospital got bombed. Today, I want to share with us God's calling for Israel, which is a very hard and painful one. And I want to share how he will also use Israel as a key instrument to bring about the end of the world and the return of Christ. Israel has a very important role in God's master plan for the return of Christ and the end of the world. Now once we know better, we can pray more effectively for Israel and the conflict. Now, let me begin by telling us the early history of Israel. As you all know, God called Abraham to relocate from Ur to Canaan. Ur was in present Iraq and Canaan is present Israel. Not long after Abraham arrived at Canaan, God made a covenant with Abraham. He told Abraham that he will give him many descendants. He will give them the land of Canaan for them to live in, and they in turn must be circumcised. As we all know, Abraham had a son called Isaac. Isaac had two sons. One of them was called Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. They moved down to live in Egypt due to a famine. They stayed in Egypt for 430 years. Now during the 430 years, they multiplied from 70 persons to 2 million people. Then Moses brought them out. They traveled in the Sinai uh, wilderness for 40 years. After that, Joshua led them to fight their way into Canaan. They drove out the Canaanites and settled in the land. They established a new nation called Israel. Now during the reign of Rehoboam, the fourth king, due to his lack of wisdom and misrule, Israel broke into two nations, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom called Israel consisted of 10 tribes and the southern kingdom called Judah consisted of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Now, most of the rulers in the northern kingdom were bad and led the nation astray. As a result, the nation became very sinful, the idolatry, injustice, sexual immorality, slavery, corruption, etc. Now God punished them by sending the Assyrians to invade their country. The survivors were exiled to other parts of the Assyrian Empire. The Northern Kingdom ceased to exist after that. This occurred in the year 721 BC or 721 years before the birth of Jesus. The Southern Kingdom didn't learn the lesson from the Northern Kingdom. They became even more sinful. Despite numerous warnings by the prophets like Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, they didn't repent. So God sent the Babylonians to attack the Southern Kingdom. The Southern Kingdom was conquered 
in the year 586 BC. The survivors were taken into exile in Babylon. As a result, the southern kingdom also ceased to exist. It was absorbed into the Babylonian Empire. After the destruction by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, Israel no longer existed as a sovereign or independent country. They no longer had their own government. They didn't have their own country until the year 1948. From 586 BC to 1948, they were ruled by other governments. Now let me give you a timeline. From, from 586 BC to 539 BC, they were under the Babylonians. From 539 to 331 BC, they were under the Persians. From 312 up to 63 BC, they were under the Greeks or Seleucids. From 63 BC until 390 AD, after the birth of Jesus, they were under the Romans. From 390 up to 634 AD, they were under the Byzantines or Christian Eastern Rome Empire. From 634 to 1099 AD, they were under the Umayyads or you can call them the Caliphates or Arabs. From the year 1099 to 1291, they were under the Christian Crusaders from Europe and also under the Mongols for some time. From the year 1291 until 1517, they were under the Mamluks or the Egyptians. From the year 1516 to the year 1917, they were under the Ottomans or the Turks. And from the year 1917 until 1948, they were under the British. And in the year 1948, Israel became a sovereign nation. Now you can see that after the exile to Babylon in the year 586 BC, Israel had been ruled by other nations until 1948. Now there's a total of 2,434 years. Now 2,434 years is really a long, long time. Now during the 2,434 years, Israel had changed hands many times. Many rulers fought over it. Israel is like a piece of bone that many dogs fought over. So the Jews suffer a lot of destruction. Most of the victorious rulers were harsh with the Jews. The Jews suffered persecutions, forced conversions, imprisonments, massacre, evictions, etc. Now the Romans were particularly harsh with them. The Jews resented them. For example, in the year 4 BC, the Romans crucified as many as 2,000 Jews in a single day. In the year 66 AD, the Jews revolted against the Romans because the Romans took the gifts from the temple treasury. The Roman army laid siege to Jerusalem for four years. The Roman army took four long years to conquer Jerusalem and destroy its temple because the city was surrounded by three thick, tall and strong walls. The Jewish historian Josephus recorded that a few hundred thousand Jews lost their lives during the four-year fight. That was very, very painful. Now, during the period of the Greeks and the Romans, many, during the Greek and the Roman empires, many Jews migrated to other parts of the empires. 
mainly for commercial reasons. Now we come to the letter history. Now in later centuries, during the time Israel was ruled by other governments or other empires, more Jews migrated due to wars, invasions, and persecutions in Israel. By the beginning of the 20th century, 1900, 1900, several million Jews were already living in Europe. However, the Jews in Europe didn't find life in Europe easy. In fact, it was hard. They still faced persecutions like massacres and expulsions. There were two reasons for this. The first one was their inability to assimilate. Their religion was different or quite different from the Europeans. They worship in synagogues, uh, practice circumcision, they observe the Sabbath and other festivals like Passover, uh, unleavened bread, Pentecost, etc. Now the second reason for their persecution was jealousy. Now generally speaking, they were rich and successful. And they own a lot of uh, businesses. They were intelligent and dominated important professions like uh, scientists, doctors, engineers, etc. Now one of them, we, I think we all know him, he was Albert Einstein who helped to invent the atomic bomb. Now many Jewish scientists were sacked by Hitler when they, he came to power. So they had to move to the Western countries. So they became Hitler's gift to the West. Now their persecution reached its peak during World War II. Hitler rounded up 6 million Jews all over Europe and sent them by trains to the concentration camps. And there they were herded into big gas chambers to be put to death. Then the cops were burned in huge furnaces that ran 24 hours a day throughout World War II. In the year 1896, a Jewish leader in Europe called Theodor Hazel started a Jewish movement called Zionism. The purpose was to re-establish the nation of Israel. The Zionism organization encouraged and assisted Jews to migrate to Palestine. Now, Palestine was called Canaan in the time of the Old Testament, or Israel as we call it today. Now, Jews started to migrate from the year 1900 to 1948. Now, before the migration started, the local population consisted of several tens of thousands of Jews, local Jews, and half a million Palestinians or Arabs. They had good relations, but as more and more migrants arrived, uh, bought land from the Palestinians and built new settlements or farming settlements, the Palestinians grew alarmed of losing their land and being driven out. The Jewish migration gathered speed when Hitler came to power and made life hard for them. And most of them came by illegal ships and the British were not so welcoming uh, because of fear the Arabs uh, opposition. So they tried to stop these Jews from migrating to Palestine. By the year 1948, there were about 800,000 Jews living in Palestine. So it was no wonder protests, fights, and killings began to take place between the Jews and the Palestinians. 
Now, in the year 1917, the British defeated the Ottoman Arab leader ruling over Palestine. From 1917 to 1948, the British controlled Palestine. The death of 6 million Jews during World War II had generated a lot of sympathy for the Jews. Many people in the world felt they deserved to have a country of their own where they could live safely. In the year 1947, the United Nations voted to divide Palestine into two new countries. One a Jewish state and second a Palestinian state. Now the decision stirred up strong opposition from the Palestinians because they and their ancestors had lived in the land for so long. In the year 1948, the Jews declared independence. The Arab nations vehemently opposed and declared war on Israel. People found it hard to believe that a new nation could fight a huge superior Arab army. The war lasted for about a year, but the Jews won. The war created a huge refugee problem. As many as 750,000 Palestinians fled their homes due to fear or to avoid war. Now of this number, a third fled to the West Bank, at that time still under the control of Jordan. A third fled to Gaza and the rest uh, ran to, Arab, to other Arab countries like Lebanon and Syria. Now they live in refugee camps. Now Arab countries refused to give them citizenship. Now their rationale was the refugees had right of return to their homes. Now only Jordan granted citizenship to 200,000 refugees. So most of the Palestinian refugees became landless and stateless. Some estimates put the number of refugees at about 5.5 million today. But about 150,000 Palestinians stayed behind in Israel and they were made citizens of the country. They made about 21% of Israel's population today. Now today, Israel has about 9.3 million people. Now this is another interesting development uh, worthy of mention. Now the establishment of Israel in 1948 and the displacement of Palestinians caused many Jews to return to Israel. There were many Jews living in Arab nations like Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Yemen, Algeria, Libya and Morocco. Now their families had lived there for hundreds of years or even longer than that and they faced hostile attacks from their Arab neighbors or the Arab people. From 1948 to 1951, as many as 800,000 Jews were expelled or forced to flee these Arab nations. As many as 500,000 of them were absorbed into the new state of Israel. That means they migrated to Israel. Others fled to Europe and North America. Now in later years, in the 1960s, uh, in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and even until now, many came back, many Jews came back from Russia, Iran, Ethiopia, South Africa, Argentina, France, and the United States. The total number of these returnees come to a few hundred thousand. Now, for Israel, their biggest concern was peace or security. Israel is surrounded by Arab nations who are angry with its assistance or its refusal to accept back the Palestinian 
refugees. After 1948, or after the 1948 war, Israel fought three more wars in 1956, 1967, and 1973. Now, in the 1956 war, Israel fought with Egypt over the issue of management of the Swiss Canal. Egypt nationalized the Anglo-French company uh, managing the canal. The United Kingdom and France also joined Israel to attack Egypt. They seized the canal, but uh, later they withdrew because of international pressure. The 1967 war was significant. Egypt, Syria and Jordan attacked Israel. Israel won the war and gained new territories like the Golan Heights, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, Sinai Peninsula and the old city of Jerusalem. Now you look at the map on your right side, the Golan Heights is in the north, captured from Syria. The West Bank is in the middle, uh, captured from Jordan. The Gaza, Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula are to the south, uh, captured from Egypt. Israel's attack and conquest of the West Bank also drove off many Palestinians into Jordan. Israel did act kindly to the Palestinians remaining in the West Bank. They, Israel has taken one third of the land of West Bank and built housing for the Jews. But the lands taken have been privately owned by the Palestinians. And they approved very little of the local Palestinians' applications to build their own homes. So the Palestinians do have legitimate grievances against Israel. And this is one issue many Christians have overlooked. In the 1973 war, Israel was attacked by Egypt, Jordan, Iraq and Syria. The Arab nations hit their war plans very well. Israel was caught by surprise. And during the first few days, the Arab armies advanced rapidly. And for some time, Israel was in real danger. But Israel managed to beat back the Arab armies. What is the cause of the fight between the Israelis and the Palestinians and their Arab supporters. <clears throat> now for the Jews, they believe they have exclusive or undivided right to the land of Israel, the West Bank and Jerusalem. It is their God-given land. For the Palestinians, they have two groups representing them. The first group is the Hamas. They represent the Palestinians living in Gaza. The Hamas want the country Israel to be destroyed. So for them, no negotiation. The second group is the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority represents the Palestinians living in the West Bank. But West Bank is under the control of Israel. The Palestinian Authority can only act and administer a small area under the supervision of Israel. So they are seen as the puppet government of Israel. Peacemakers have offered two possible solutions to the conflict. The first plan, all Palestinians return to live in Israel, but Israel can't accept it because the Palestinians will form the majority and hold political power. Israel insists all Palestinians must settle outside 
the border of Israel. The second plan form a Palestinian country comprising West Bank and Gaza with its headquarters in East Jerusalem. Some Israeli politicians are open to the idea, but they insist the new Palestinian country must be demilitarized. That means it will not have an army, so that Israel will not be attacked. But the Israelis won't allow Jerusalem to be made the capital of the new Palestinian state. Because for them, Jerusalem is their city. It must forever be their city and be undivided. Many American presidents have tried to broker peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Nixon had done it. Nixon had tried it. Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Obama, Trump, and Biden. They all had tried, but they failed. So we can expect the conflict to drag on for some more time. Now, how will the problem be resolved? I think only one person can do it. That is the Antichrist. The Antichrist. The book of Revelation talks about the coming of a world ruler who can control the whole world. His number is 66. He will have everyone to install his number in either their right hand or their forehead. Without it, you can buy and sell. Now, this technology is already available. I have seen a video of a man with a chip implanted on his right hand and by showing his, his hand for scanning, the door opened by itself. The world is increasingly becoming paperless and cashless. Now this technology will become mature and be accepted. All our bank information, our medical information and personal information can be stored in a one tiny chip and implanted in our right hand or our forehead. So when we go to the supermarket, airport or government departments to do business, we don't have to bring any documents. We just need to wave our hand. So convenient. Now John saw a vision of, of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is pictured as a hybrid beast. It has the body of a leopard has a bear's feet and a lion's mouth. It has seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads and ten horns refer to kings. This means the Antichrist is head of a coalition of governments or head of a political and economic bloc. As we know of the world's political and economic condition today, only Europe has a powerful political and economic bloc. It's called the European Union. If you are European, you can travel in Europe without passport. You can import from any country in a bloc without paying taxes. And you can study and work in any member country. So the Antichrist is most likely an European or leader of the European Union. The beast will broker a peace, a peace treaty between the Israelis and the Palestinians and the Arab backers. Before I say further, uh, let me give you some information that are relevant to this matter. In Israel, there's a group of Jews called the Orthodox Jews. They subscribe to the Old Testament teachings and practice the law of Moses, which is 
also called the Torah. They don't believe that Jesus has come as a Messiah. They believe there is another one coming. Now they want to build a temple because the temple is a central part of their worship. They all the money, the blueprint, the equipment of the temple already. They also have set up an institute to train the priests to manage a temple. They are ready to build, but there is only one problem. The location of the temple. It must be exactly on the same spot of the original temple. And that spot is now occupied by a mosque, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The mosque has a shrine called the Dome of the Rock. The mosque is regarded the third holiest one in the Muslim world. The Muslims believe Prophet Muhammad went, went up to heaven from there. The mosque is in East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem was annexed by Israel in the 1967 war. It means it's under the control of Israel. Israel will not allow the mosque to be dismantled and have the temple built on it because it will definitely create another war with her Arab neighbors. People have wondered how the temple could be built. Well, I think it's up to God to decide this matter. We will look at what the Antichrist will do to Israel. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 says, He will confirm a covenant with many for one servant. In the middle of the servant, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that his decree is poured out on him. Now this verse is talking about the Antichrist. Servant means seven years. So the Antichrist, the Antichrist will broker a peace treaty between Israel and the Arabs. The peace treaty is to last seven years. But in the middle of the peace treaty, in the third and half year, he will betray the Jews. He will set up a statue of himself in the temple and force the Jews to worship it. Paul also mentioned the work of the Antichrist in Israel. He mentioned in one of his letters. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will assault himself over everything that is called God or is worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. The Antichrist is very powerful. His image can speak and whoever refuses to worship to worship it will be killed. Revelation chapter 13 verse 15 The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Of course, the Jews were opposite. So a war will break out. The Antichrist and his allies will send their armies to fight Israel. Other nations will join in too. Now in the war, Israel will suffer severe losses. Zechariah chapter 14 verse 1 to 4 
I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the mountain, on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. Israel will suffer huge and painful losses during the battle, but in the midst of the desperate fight, Jesus will return to fight for Israel. He will destroy the Antichrist and his armies. Jesus will also send mega disasters to the world before he appeared and while destroying or fighting the Antichrist. Now some of the disasters are mentioned in Revelation. I just mentioned tree, an asteroid, fall into the ocean, destroying a third of the ships. The sun burning extra hot, scorching the people. A global earthquake that flattens all the mountains, cause all the islands to shift their positions and cause all the cities to collapse. Just imagine Singapore shifted its position. Borneo, all the islands in Indonesia and Philippines shifted the position. And there are other disasters I don't have time to mention. Then, after defeating the Antichrist, Jesus will cast the Antichrist and his false prophet into the lake of fire. Jesus will lock up the devil in the abyss for 1,000 years. Then he will rule on earth from Jerusalem for 1,000 years. We will be resurrected and rule with him. Now this period is called the millennium. Now, who will we rule? The survivors. Let me read Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. There will be very few survivors in the world because of the mega disasters and the final world war. Very few can survive when the global earthquake flattens every mountain, causes all the islands to shift their positions and all the cities to collapse. Very few survivors. The survivors will be allowed to live, have children, grow old and die. They have the right to choose to believe or reject Jesus. At the end of 1,000 years, the devil will be released. By that time, the world has a lot of people. He will, will lead them to oppose Jesus. Jesus will destroy them and send them into the lake of eternal fire. Then God will create a new heaven and a new earth. Some may protest, how could God allow some non-believers to survive and live in a new millennium? That's very unfair. What the Bible has expressly said, the non-believers are the gods, and they will be rejected, and they will be separated from the sheep, they will not be saved. The Lord might allow the survivors to live to repopulate the earth, but deny them salvation because they had not received Christ before his coming. 
All the survivors could be children. How will God save Israel? As of now, there are about 9.3 million Jews. Of this number, 185,000 are Christians. But it's only 1.97% of the total population. 1.97%, about 2%. That's very tiny. Now, of this 185,000, 75.8% are Arab Christians. 75.8% of the 185,000, they are Arab Christians. So Jewish Christians are so few. In Romans chapter 11, Paul answered the question, why so few Jews become believers? He explained that this is the time of the Gentiles. When the quota of Gentile believers is filled up, God will, re- God will turn to the Jews and save them. Paul said that when God called Abraham, the calling is permanent or unbreakable, irrevocable. Abraham and his descendants are forever his people. When the time comes, he will move them to believe in him. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 to 27 says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening, in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be safe. As is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. Israel has a very hard life. Her calling is for most part of her history painful. It's mainly due to their ignorance. The Messiah had come for them 2,000 years ago, but didn't accept him. They rejected him, and they paid a very high price. Now, how to pray for Israel? First, pray for the Jews to turn to God and not trust in their military might. Second, pray for the believers in Israel that they will be faithful in witnessing and teaching the new believers. Third, pray for God to protect Israel. Fourth, pray for the Palestinians and Arabs that they will turn to God. Paul said this is the time of salvation of the Gentiles. The Arabs are also Gentiles, so we can say this is the time of salvation of the Arabs. Fifth, Pray that God will protect the Palestinians in Gaza. Six, pray for comfort for the Jewish and Palestinian families who have lost their loved ones due to killings and bombings. Seven, pray for the aid organizations and Christians who are working in Gaza to help the suffering people. Eight, Pray for God to work to fulfill all the prophecies about Israel and for believers to be ready to face the persecution of the Antichrist. Amen. Let me share a vision seen by a member during the Wednesday prayer meeting on 12th of 12th April this year. Now this is the vision. I saw a raging sea, then I saw a man coming down from the clouds, which I presume to be the Lord. He calmed the raging seas, and it was peaceful again. And I saw fishing boats going around and making a good catch. I believe the Lord will help us. We just need to trust in Him and do our part, 
and there will be many souls saved. If you want to contribute to our theological education fund, please get the anonymous commitment form from our treasurer, Mr. Tio Dontek. We want to have enough funds to send a person or a couple to receive proper theological education or training. Now, he or they will be my successor. It will take the person or the couple three years to get a theological degree. Now, some don't have high regard for theological education, but I believe it is very important. A pastor has it. I have greatly benefited, benefited from my theological studies in Seminary Theology Malaysia in Saramban. We are now training four members to do evangelism using the Evangelism Explosion course. We have just finished the second session of this EE program. Now, there are 11 more sessions to go. Our sessions are done after the Sunday service refreshment. We encourage you to attend the weekly prayer meeting at 8 p.m. every Wednesday. We have seen God answering prayers, helping people who have health problem, legal problem, financial and other difficulties. I can't give you the details because of confidentiality reason, but prayer does work. Some of us are busy attending online seminars, inter-church or even international prayer meetings, but don't attend the local church prayer meetings. Now that's not right because the local church is the one that does the witnessing, shepherding and teaching of young believers. The devil constantly fights these ministries. The devil also tempts the believers. So we need to pray for and with the local church. Let me now say the closing prayer. Let's pray. Father, we pray for Israel. Your covenant with Israel is unbreakable. They are forever your people. Lord, at this time, there are so few believers in Israel. We pray that you will help them to be faithful, bold, diligent, and unwanted in witnessing to their fellow countrymen. We pray that they will be strong in their faith in this difficult time so that they can point their fellow countrymen back to you. We ask you to soften the hearts of the Jews. Remove their stubbornness, pride and unbelief. Lift the veil of spiritual blindness so that they can understand that Jesus is really the Lamb that takes away the sins of the whole world. Father, may the prophecies by your prophets all come to fulfillment. May your will for Israel and the world be carried out. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>